And just to give you a little bit about information about myself, I've got um, 30 years, 30 plus years of experience in, in AutoCAD across multiple industry segments. Um, I've taught AutoCAD at a community college as a certified instructor. Um, I've done 13 plus years in CAD management. I spent the last eight years in shipbuilding, um, both new build and revitalizations. Five years doing support for civil survey landscape architecture before that. I've worked in mechanical design, electrical, electromechanical, printed circuit board schematic design, architectural and acoustic design, and doing equipment layouts in industrial spaces. Um, I have a bachelor's in business management and a master's in organizational management. So that's a little bit about me. So here's today's agenda. So we're gonna talk about setting this up and we're talking about training. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is building an effective program. Then we're gonna talk about how to create effective training materials. And part of that effective training materials is conveyance of standards and their importance in your company. We're gonna talk about using mentors. We're gonna talk about building a feedback loop into the program to help drive future training and building timelines for follow-up. Now, the reason why all of these things are in here is that they're all critical components to understand how and why a training program is either successful or is not successful. So the first thing is we're gonna build an effective program. So we're gonna get started. And I always start these things when I do this by doing interviews. And we do that by interviewing the last few new hires in your organization. Okay, it's very critical to find out from them because they're the last ones that will have experienced what they would have liked to have had prior to starting the job or what they would have liked to have had in the first couple of weeks. Make a list of questions to ask. The two key questions to ask in here is do they do in-person learning like classroom-based learning or do they do e-learning like self-paced learning? Which is more important to them? Because you may want to be building two programs um, that run side by side. One is an e-learning self-paced and the other one is going to be a classroom base or you may have a combination of both. Another thing is to make pointed inquiries to draw out the key points to focus on for training. What specific needs and wants for your organization do you need to make sure that you capture in the training? And then find out reasons for, previous, uh, for any previous employees that didn't complete the probationary period where it's applicable. Was it their quality of work? Was it the ability to complete a project on time? Was it related to their CAD skills? If it was anything that you have the option of changing or modifying, this is where you need to figure out where this information comes from and how you modify it for the future behaviors. So now that you've talked to the employees, let's talk about platform specific questions. So have they ever used AutoCAD or I, I say AutoCAD here because it's generic, but have they ever used Revit before? Have they ever used, you know, whatever design program you're working? It can be SolidWorks, it can be Contia. Have they ever used it before? Question number one. The next one is, were they using that software previously and are now using a vertical product? So if they, were, if they are very experienced in AutoCAD and you're moving them up to Civil 3D, there's gonna be some challenges that they're gonna encounter and you need to know this. Were they using a prior version of AutoCAD or the verticals prior to your company? Um, you know, as we all know, software changes and adapts and gets better slowly over time. And the big thing is finding out whether or not they're using an older version. So they may have a different skill set, or you may just have some slight things that you need to teach them about what the new version has or what the version you're using. And the big question is, when was the last time they used CAD professionally? And again, CAD here is a generic term. You could say, when was the last time they used Revit professionally? When was the last time they used this professionally? In some cases, you're gonna have college students that have just gotten their degrees, whether civil engineering, architecture, and they will have done very little CAD work to that point, and it's important to know that they've never used CAD professionally, that they've only done a couple of CAD classes in college if they've taken them and so that you know where your baseline is. So once you have all of those questions, now you talk about your standards. And these are the questions you need to ask yourself and your organization. Are the standards that you use easily accessible and user friendly? Those are the two key critical parts for understanding your standards usage. Do you have a repository? Do, do you just hand them a paper book? How do you make sure that the standards are easily accessible? And are they user friendly? Are the standards already pre-populated in your base drawing templates or do you import or insert them for each drawing? 
The big thing is, is in multidiscipline firms or firms that have different specializations, even if it's the same discipline, are they using different standards? And if they're using different standards, then you want to make sure that you are tailoring your information for which team they belong to. And are they working on drawings that are not following the current standards? This is another killer. Um, a lot of times you will find people that get handed red line drawings from a few years ago, your standards have morphed, and so they're not following, they're not working on drawings that are following your current standards. And are your standards followed 100% of the time? And as in, I stated in my CAD management class, standards need to be there to provide a guideline and a rigid starting point, but they need to have some flexibility. So. You know, if they're being followed 100% of the time, that means that your standards are effective and they're built with the flexibility needed to get the jobs done. And what do you do with incoming drawings from outside consultants? This may or may not apply to you, but it's important to understand that every consultant that you do business with, if they're not following your standards, there needs to be a thought process on how do you manipulate their drawings to make them fit your standards or how do you adapt their drawings to that information. So let's talk about that, and now we've got some other questions. Did they receive complete information necessary to complete a project, okay? You know, did their manager sit down and give them, this is the expectations, this is what needs to be done, so on and so forth? Were they only doing red line edits for the first few weeks or months of being on the job, or were they just thrown directly to the wolves, okay? Did you have a mentor or a work buddy to help them on a regular basis? Or again, were they thrown to the wolves? These are important questions to ask because this may expose things within your organization that also need to be addressed as part of the training curriculum and possibly part of your standards and CAD management. And what additional things would they have liked to have before starting the job or when they started it? Would they have liked to have some training, some familiarization, some concise instructions? A cheat sheet on where to find the important information, drives, directories, how you manage a project, where you go in and find the drawings, so on and so forth. Those things are critical, and I've always had a cheat sheet every time that I've had a new employee that's either worked for me or worked with me, that I go through and make sure that they understand, here's the drive letters, here's what we do in each of these drives, here's how you find your project information, etc. And did they understand the expectations of their performance after the 30 days, after the 90 days? Typically, when you start a job now, there's a probationary period within that 30 or 90 days that, you know, either people, either person can, you know, either the company or the employee can decide that they don't want to be there because they don't like the job or something. But did they understand the expectations of what they were supposed to do? So. With all of that, do they understand the actual process of getting the work done? So for example, do you have information on how you set up your sheet layouts, you know, title block sheet sizes? Do they understand revisioning? Do they understand plan readability? All of these things are key factors in understanding what you need to build inside of your program. Because remember, we're talking about getting new employees up to speed in your design environment. We're not talking about just CAD at this point. We're talking about everything to get your new employees up to speed. So you may have more than just a, hey, here's Revit 101. You may have something where you want to put in a class that talks about the basics of drawing, you know, the basics of setting up a sheet for proper readability and layouts. <clears throat> So once you've asked all these questions, make a list, okay? Use all of the information you've gathered during your interview process. Make a list of all the points that are critical, and then go back through those points and assign a priority. Once you've assigned the priority, you know, everything that comes in as is, is the higher priority are the things that you need to address first. And then what I recommend doing and what I've done in the past is always create a class outline for each class. So what you wanna do is you're gonna wanna start with a basic class, and then you're gonna to wanna to work your way up from there. So you're gonna always wanna build off a previous class. You wanna make sure that you break it into smaller pieces. You do not wanna have your employee the first week that he's there undergo four days of training, right? That's, that's not usually helpful, but you may want to give him a day of training, let him go back to the job for a day, come back and do day two, so on and so forth. So you wanna break it up so that they're starting to learn the information and how things are being run that way. You want to make sure you specify if it's a beginner, an intermediate, or an advanced class, because you may have people within your organization, we're talking about new employees, but we may also be talking about employees that maybe are on an older platform that you want to bring up to the new platform. 
Maybe they're a little reluctant for change. Maybe they don't want to change how they do things. So you need to find a way of creating a hook in your class to get them to draw them in. And I have a great example of that. Um, I had some civil engineers when we were converting from LAN desktop over to civil 3D. They were very hesitant to make that change until I saw that, until I showed them the fact that if I move an alignment and I've already got a vertical profile, that all of it updates and they don't have to regenerate it constantly and that I can change the profile or I can change the alignment on the fly. That was my hook, got them excited about it. They all took the class and they were, they were off to the races at that point. Make sure you give a brief summary for each class to introduce the purpose of each training session and then give an idea of how long each class or session will take to complete. Once you have all of that, you'll get something like this. Okay, here's an example. This is my Drafting 101 class. I just used Drafting 101 and it's got two to three hours per session and there's two hours, there's two sessions total. And here's my introductory. The purpose of this class is to introduce people to the basics of drafting. This is used to cover the basics of laying out sheets, what is scale, how you use it, other basic drawing conventions that are used in the industry. We'll also to cover the importance of using the same styles and why it's important to keep continuity between drawings. So session one, we're going to talk about general information and plan readability. And then in session two, we're going to talk about drawing layout, how you do sheet composition, what title blocks to use, what detail, you know, the title block, how you set up a detail sheet, how you set up a general note sheet, how you do legends, how you do schedules. All of those things are part of a single class that I taught. It's, again, two to three hours per session, and there's two sessions with this class. So once you've got these together, now you go make your proposal. So the first thing is, is you need to go talk to management. You make sure you have all of your outlines together, then you go talk to management. You want to give them examples of your class outline so they have an understanding of what it is you're trying to do. And then you need to give them the reasons for running classes. Reference employees that did not make the probationary period based on CAD performance, if that is applicable. Give estimates on how much faster or how much more efficient new employees can be productive and billable. Okay. We're all about billable time for the employees, and if you hire a new employee and it takes him 10 times longer to complete a project because he hasn't had the training or the understanding or the background, that's costing the company money. And then what I suggest doing, and this is the biggest thing, is ask for a pilot run. So what you're gonna do here is you're gonna ask permission to run one class or go through one set of training to show, that this concept and this ideology is going to work for you. So you ask for the pilot run. It allows management to see the benefit of training and allows the program to be more effective in the long run. Because you're providing a pilot run, you're not saying this is what I'm gonna do now. What you're providing them is the ability to say, this is what I wanna do. Here's how I'm going to do it. We're gonna do it once. You guys are gonna see the benefits from that group of people that go through this training. And then we can come back and say, all right, we can allocate more time for this, or we can make sure that this becomes part of our company culture to make sure that we train our employees when they start. And then ask for a dedicated training area to conduct training, okay? When I'm talking about a dedicated training area, it can be find an area that doesn't disrupt normal workday activities, like an empty office, an unused conference room for a day, something like that. And in most cases, there are usually spare PCs or use lower end unused PCs with identical configurations where possible. Um, if the employee has a computer already assigned to them, have them bring it. You know, you're not talking about spending money to make this happen, you're talking about spending time to make it better for in the long run. And so what you wanna do is minimize any of the expenses that you're gonna have. Now, all of this stuff is more for the traditional side. But as part of this, you also need to be thinking about if people prefer to do e-learning, and a lot of the younger generation prefers e-learning or self-paced learning, what you're going to want to do then is you're going to want to set up a training class to talk about how the e-learning system works. It may only be a two-hour class, but you're going to talk specifically about how you log into the portal, how you go through the training, how you conduct it, what you need to do when you finish, so on and so forth. Again, you're going to want to get your employees to understand these are the expectations, here's the process that we're gonna go through to make sure that you can get through the training properly and go from there. Now what we're gonna talk about is the big thing, is creating effective materials for training. I will tell you right now, this will make or break your program, okay? 
the training materials you put together, assemble, or, or get from wherever need to be relative to the work you do. Metric versus imperial, and if you have actual work examples, those are the best. And I'm gonna tell you right now, metric versus imperial is huge in some cases. I had a group of surveyors that I was running through, and I was just using the out-of-the-box course material that I was given. And one of the operations is to go through and we're creating a surface and it's metric. And I had none of the surveyors were balking at the fact that we were doing metric information because we don't do metric in that company. We don't do anything in meters, we don't do anything in metric system, everything is imperial. And I'm like, it doesn't matter what we're talking about is the concept, we're not talking about this particular job and they couldn't get past that. So. I took that information and when we came back through for the second round of surveyors, I made sure that everything was imperial, okay? Once you've got all of this information, determine the method. Are you gonna do in-person classroom based? You know, classroom type based, you know, are you gonna take over a conference room, have a couple of people in there, you know, going through, doing the typical instructor type? Or are you gonna use e-learning or self-paced? And remember, if you do e-learning or self-paced, you have to have a mechanism for tracking progress and you have to have a mechanism for reporting results. If you don't have either of those methods, then someone can say, oh yeah, I'm going through the e-learning, I'm just about through it. But if you don't have any method of tracking that, then you cannot prove one way or the other. And remember, everything is about proving to management that your program is going to work and be successful. And if your program works and is successful, you need to have the backup to show that. And that's part of that reporting. When you go to the classroom based, you obviously have a sign-in sheet so you can show that each person showed up, so on and so forth. And while you're interacting with the students, you can figure out who is going to need some additional help, who is just taken to the software and running with it, so on and so forth. So, and utilize Autodesk training materials as the backbone, or manuals as the backbone for your materials. I cannot stress this enough, the Autodesk training materials are great for delivering concepts. And I like to use them as the backbone. I may not use the examples in there and I may not use the exercises, but I like having that information as the backbone. You use the ideas and concepts for getting points across. They're invaluable tools for yourself and it will give you multiple ways to launch different commands. Because you know, most of us only use one method to launch a command. Again, I've been using AutoCAD 31 years this year, and guess what? I still am an avid keyboard typist, right? I still have AutoCAD Classic as my interface in 2018 because that's how I perform better. Um, it will give users a chance to pick which is more comfortable for them, and each new employee is different and should be treated as such. You know, the same thing goes when you go to a big box classroom where, you know, like, when we're doing a t training class, we're teaching you the out of the book method. Um, those of us that have been instructors for a while may also teach the additional methods. So it's just important to understand that everyone's different and um, there's a certain level of comfort in how people do things. So here's resources you can use. You can always go to your reseller and get the training books. You can go reseller and get train the training classes. One of the things that Imagine It offers is the PNOW which is, um, has tips, tricks, tutorials, things like that, or your reseller has an equivalent. Um, I'm not pitching Imagine It specifically, but your reseller may have an equivalent to that. You can always bring in a paid consultant to come in and examine what you have going on. Um, and again, that's something we can do. We can come in and do paid consulting for that to help you deliver an ideology of what you want to do for training and help you develop that training material. You also have your own network of peers. You have local and regional user groups. You have other groups and organizations to which you belong. And you have things like AIA or other industry specific organization. And another big thing that people re fail to realize is one of your resources is your power users. As a CAD manager, you spend a lot of time putting out fires and not necessarily in the program constantly. Your power users are the one that can help drive some of this information and come up with great projects for you to have as part of your training materials. All right, we're gonna continue creating the effective materials. So remember, set up the materials with your standards. Again, your standards are going to make or break this. Remember to add any materials that use any custom programming. So if you have custom list programs, um, any VB, VBA, ARX.net, 
tool palettes, any third-party programs like the utilities for Revit, Civil 3D, Vault, et cetera. If you are using those in your design environment, make sure that you're capturing that information as part of your training materials. And make sure that the users understand what those functions do and what those commands do. If you're using an electronic document management system, okay, I'm gonna talk about Vault. Um, you could be talking about uh, the PDM from SOLIDWORKS. You could be talking about any number of these electronic document management systems. Okay, we're gonna be talking about setting up a training folder, set up generic logins, do not give them access to the live data until training is complete, and then show, allow them to see what happens if they don't follow the protocols. For example, drawings that are left locked in vault, drawings that are not checked in correctly. This is all part of the training material because if you're using an electronic document management system, there is a process flow that needs to be captured and gone through and make sure that the users understand. All of that information is all about creating your effective training materials, okay? Once you have those training materials together and you have your class outline and you're ready to run your first class, make sure you have a list of class rules and approximate break times. So here's my AutoCAD training class information. So all right, when you come in, please log into the computer with your username and password. Please no surfing, checking email, or working on anything else, but what the instructor has told you to work on this class, an opportunity for you to learn, please respect it. There's a folder on your desktop, network, blah, 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 with the relevant instructional materials. Please only use the one you're instructed as the others will be for other classes. Again, this comes back to that multidiscipline firm is that you may have multiple training classes that are all using the same machines and you may want one group, maybe the highway group working off the highway folder and you may have the uh, storm and sanitary group working in the storm and sanitary folder. You may have interior designers work on the interior design, whether you have the architects working on the architects. All right, so following is a breakdown of the class times. We're gonna start at eight, we're gonna end at noon, that's the first half of the day, and we will pick a 10 to 15 minute break in this block of time. I'm not gonna put down an exact number because not everyone works you know, an exact time when we'll take the break, but understand that there will be a break in there. We'll take a lunch break. Um, in my case, lunch was not provided, um, but if lunch is provided, make sure you state that here. And then we go through the last part of the day. And again, there'll be another 10 to 15 minute break in this block of time. And the big thing is remember to have fun and ask questions when you have them. This training is for you, okay? So once you have your class rules and make sure that everyone has those, you deliver the training, okay? Big thing, be enthusiastic and confident. Do not deliver in a monotone. Do not hand out the materials or binders and expect the users to go through the exercises on their own. Do not lecture, use interactive training. And what I mean by that is what I've had to do and how I've done this is I'm like, all right, everyone eyes up here. Let me show you how this works. I show them and then I have them do the same thing that I just showed them. Use a projector and a screen. I cannot stress this enough. Make sure you have a projector and a screen. Walk through each lesson to show what you're going to do and what you expect them to be able to do. Have your handouts ready. Always have handouts before each class starts. So it allows you to jump right into training and include white space in the handouts for anywhere where you think the employees would like to write down notes, other ideas as they go through each lesson and be on time and start on time. Begin promptly at the appointed time. Do not delay for stragglers and make sure that you stress to them that latecomers should understand that they will have to catch up to the class, that we're not gonna hold the class back on our time if they come in late, that they're gonna have to catch up to where we are in the concepts. All right, big thing is, is you're gonna need a sign-in sheet to track who has come to class and have a record of attendance. This holds true also for any e-learning, is that you're not necessarily gonna have a sign-in, but you're gonna have an account created for them and you're going to be monitoring when they log into that account, when they go through the exercises, and when they log out. Make sure you write up a summary of the class and give to your manager, because remember, we all have managers above us, and the managers of those who were in the training class. Same thing holds true for the e-learning have records to show that, you know, as, I, as one of the popular ones working in the cruise light industry, Billy the fish cook, okay? We all call him Billy the fish cook. He's the generic individual. All right, Billy the fish cook went in, he logged into the portal at 8 a.m. this morning, he completed the first three sections of the training he wanted him to get done, and he passed all those tests, excellent. You wanna make sure that the manager has that and your manager has a copy of that to show that that information has occurred and that training process has continued. 
Prepare for feedback during the class. Always have a notebook handy to jot down notes when people have questions or concepts or thoughts as you go through the class. And it's important to capture these points during the class. You can modify training for the next group or come back to that point later in the class. There are times when somebody will ask a question and you'll have to say, we're not quite there yet, hang on, I'm write it down, so that when we get to that point, we're gonna come back and address your question. After the training, take the employee back to their manager. Do this as part of the building, the character building process and the overall you know, camaraderie building that you're not just teaching them and letting them go. You're gonna take them back to the manager and say, all right, Billy the fish cook completed their training today. Here you go. This is what we've covered so far so that the manager understands what that person has learned today. And then when possible, Set up a mentor for the employee so that that employee doesn't constantly come to you unless you want to be the mentor. But you want to have somebody within that group, that design group or that design department that should be their go-to for the basic questions. And try to find someone who's, not, who's approachable, who's very likable, things like that, because it should be a senior person on the team. They should be knowledgeable in the overall process of what's expected, and they're, they're not there to handhold. They're there to answer the rudimentary questions that are gonna come up as the employee starts going through the actual process of doing the work. So after training, provide feedback, okay? There's a feedback email that will drive results for the next training session, okay? And what that means is have a couple of questions that you send out to the employees that have done their training and you want them to be very, and make sure that they are all open-ended questions, not closed-ended, not yes, no, maybes. You want them to be there. You want them to give you a actual response. Be prepared to accept negative feedback and build off of it. If you get something negative back, find out what it was that was specifically the problem, address it for the next class, and go back and address it with that user. This gives you uh, options to change your methods, change the time and or the materials to address some of these issues. Here's an example. This is, this is actually one that I got back. It says, what suggestions do you have for improving the training class? And somebody said, I wish we had handouts that followed the lessons for each day. If you were looking at your computer while Ryan clicked on something, then you missed it and fell behind, Ryan would then stop so that you could catch up. Happened to everybody. Class felt like a lot of clicking, but necessary to learn the program. Training went so fast, it was impossible to take notes. So as you see in here, I took this as a positive feedback to tell me that I was not doing my job effectively. So I went back through, started creating handouts for the class, tried to make sure that I put a little more time in the class and that we just weren't clicking through everything and wanted to make sure that it was more interactive. Now, um, for the class after this, and I know who this person was actually, and she was very instrumental in helping develop the course curriculum for me by giving me feedback like this, is that I actually developed my program to actually work better and have fewer hiccups in it for the next set of classes that I, I went through. So after you've done all this, follow up with management. It's important to show the management the results of your pilot training. Okay, so when possible, get numbers from accounting for billable time for new employees. Get feedback from the employee's manager. Were they more efficient? Were they more capable? Are they performing the same, better, or worse than the last new hire for that manager? All of these things are important because you need to have finite data that shows that your training program has a return on the investment because the investment is time. They're investing time in that employee to go through the training and you wanna show them that that employee is now faster, more efficient, able to do the projects in a more reasonable time when they start based on this information. Use a percentage value too, that you're showing, all right, we are 10% more effective going through this training program. If that seems too high, lower it. Do not ever say that this employee was 125% more efficient out of the training class, because I'll tell you right now, management will raise an eyebrow and question that. If you feel that that number is too high, lower it. But what you're doing is you're using this data to help drive the point to management on the value of keeping the program in-house and to continue to train new employees as they come in. That's the whole point of this. And that you want your program to be successful. In order for it to be successful, you have to have management buy-in. And you get management buy-in by delivering these kinds of results to them. 
So in conclusion, we're talking about you need to provide a framework for creating a training program, whether it's an e-learning training program, whether it is a classroom-led, whether it's a combination of both, a hybrid, something like that, you have to provide a framework. This becomes the starting point for all of you. What this is going to get you is a better trained workforce in your office and is going to allow you to be able to capture the projects and be able to do the work more efficiently, especially if you have a surge in employee numbers. You know, And why do you need to persist in training? How else will I cut down on new employees' CAD questions? How will I educate new employees on the standards in your company processes? This is why you persist in training. This is why you always want to drive training through. As a CAD manager, when I was not doing training classes for the employees and we hired someone new and I did not have the time to go through a training class, it was always, how do I do this? How do I do this? And that new person was constantly at my desk, okay? And you want to make sure that as part of this, what you're doing is that you're trying to get the, the ideology that you're going to embrace training as part of your company's culture. If your company's culture doesn't embrace training now, what you need to do is change that culture. You need to put something in place that gives them the idea that you want to make training those new employees that come into your design environment as part of your company culture. When you make that part of your company culture, now you're gonna be able to develop the materials better, you're gonna be able to go through and really drive home the fact that this is how you guys can create and capture better jobs, more jobs, things like that. And that's pretty much what I have.